Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Karimot Odevade, and I'm one of the 17 young leaders for the Sustainable Development Goals recognized by the United Nations. You're welcome to the third practical session of the Educate.B 2023 International Conference on Education and Decent Work. Once again, my name is Karimot Odevadi, and I'm happy to moderate this exciting conversation on how education and training can contribute to smoother school-to-work transitions for young people. Good morning, good evening, everybody. Uh, greetings from uh, VVOB in Brussels. Um, so let me start by uh, introducing the session of today. So the topic, as you have seen, is uh, what uh, education interventions can do to smoothen the transition of young people from school to work. Um, with a large and growing youth population in the world and educational expansion, secondary education, general and TVET are rapidly becoming the springboard, springboard to the world of work. But for many young people, especially in low and middle income countries, especially young women and young people with uh, disabilities, the school to work transition is a difficult and long process. And to a large extent, that may be due to how the world of work is structured. Uh, for example, the pace of job creation is not keeping up with the youthful demographics. Um, the economies are largely informal, etc. Nevertheless, schools can take positive action to smoothen that school to work transition and as such to increase young people's chances of accessing decent work. In this virtual round table, five speakers will highlight how and under what conditions schools can make their critical contribution. Alisa Mega, Miguel Herrera, Sarah Elder, Justin Casongo, and Annette Francis Paracal. You will get to know them better soon and you can find a link to their bios in the chat. Today's session will consist of three rounds of discussion on the following questions. What does decent work mean for each of the speakers? What can teachers and school leaders do to make it easier for young people to transition from school or from the TVET institution to decent work? And what conditions need to be put in place to make it easier for schools and TVET institutions to play their part in smooth school to work transitions? Please feel very welcome to put your comments and questions in the chat throughout the session, and we'll make sure to capture them and we'll address them before closing. Thank you so much, Mahud, for taking So Before we dive into the discussion, let me give each of the speakers the opportunity to briefly introduce themselves. Alice, please go ahead. What would you like to tell us about yourself in about two, two minutes? And please give us um, yeah, a small sign when you are. Uh, ready to move to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Maud, and thank you for your organization for putting this together. This is a very relevant conversation, and I look forward to engaging with um, my co-speakers and also to interacting with your audience. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're tuning in from. I am Dr. Alice Amega. I am the founder of education and aspirations hub in Ghana. And I work as a consultant with the World Bank education and technology team. Uh, education aspirations hub is more or less a pilot project as part of my PhD research at the University of Cambridge. And so it is a very young organization for young people um, that supports the idea of uh, employer engagement, career guidance and counseling. The idea is despite the global aspiration to achieve the sustainable development goals, especially goal four, five and eight and 10, we found out that a lot of young people, especially girls, um, persons with disability and young people growing up in fragile conflict states do not have the kind of support to ensure their smooth school to work transitions. One of the critical missing link is the fact that there isn't enough structured um, support to ensure that young people are receiving the adequate information, but also thinking about what the world of your work look like now and how it would look in the future. And so what Education Aspirations Hub is beginning to do in Ghana is to 
support young people to think about these various careers, specializing in STEM, but also in TVET, which is the core area of my specialization. So we have three broad programs, Inspiring the Future, Inspiring STEM and TVET, and Inspiring Experiential Learning. And what these three programs for education and aspirations have mean to, to, to do for young people is to ensure that we are inspiring them to think about a, a varied education and aspiration um, careers pathways. But also we are challenging stereotypes. And in doing that, we are broadening young people's horizon. Um, we've engaged across Ghana in both rural and urban context, ensuring that we, we reach a large number of people. And so in about two years of our work, we've reached over 5,000 young people in Ghana through various events, especially reaching out to uh, mentors and volunteers to speak in schools, um, in career talks, um, sending young people, especially those in Tibet, to see universities, that is university um, field trip to engage, see the courses that are available in the universities. But we're also gradually moving to make community-based engagements where we are looking at getting employers within communities to engage with young people and give them different on-the-job training or practical experiences through our experiential learning program. And so what that we are, we are trying to do is to really bring the conversation about guiding young people to start thinking about their education and career pathways as soon as possible, rather than leaving it to later. And so what we are doing is we're starting our work right from uh, middle school, which is junior high school from the ages of 10, where my research has shown that young people begin to think about school, but also connect their interest and um, academic abilities to jobs that they found um, inspiring to do. So we look for, I look forward to today's um, conversation. I'm very much excited about this conversation and I, I hope it makes the impact that we are all looking for. Thank you very much, Mount. Yeah. Thank you, Alice. Yeah. Thank you so much, Maud. Um, apologies for the technical problem. Um, thank you so much, Hallis, and your it's wonderful to be joined by a sister from Ghana. Um, crossing the ocean to Ecuador, the floor is yours, Miguel. Thank you so much, and very nice to meet you all here in this panel. My name is Miguel Herrera. I'm originally from Ecuador, and I'm here representing VBOB in Ecuador. I'm currently the education manager of the organization. So VBOB is an international organization working in in nine countries, specifically in Asia, Africa, and South America. And our scope of work is mostly the, the quality of education. So we work directly with each of these ministries of education uh, in, into building strategic partnerships. And based on a previous diagnosis, we work together in specific programs focused on strengthening professional capacities and development of school leaders and teachers. Uh, uh, our work in Ecuador has been happening uh, for the past 30 years, of which around 12 or 13 years uh, has been focusing on uh, technical, and, and edu technical and vocational education and training. Uh, thank you so much for sharing these slides. Could you please go to the second slide? Yeah, so our, our most important partner in, in the country is the Ministry of Education of Ecuador, with, with whom we, we have been uh, having a partnership for the for different partnerships for a specific program focused mostly on secondary education and particularly on technical and vocational education. Could you please go to the next slide? Um, so in, in Ecuador, why technical education? Well, technical education is very important. It's part of the curriculum that we have here in the country. And specifically, the productive technical education is an area that is um, very relevant because in our country, agriculture has a, is a cornerstone of the Ecuadorian economy. So for example, in the past year, in this year, in 2023, we saw an increase in the GDP of 9% in the productive industry, particularly in agriculture, fishing, cattle, sheep, and agriculture. And we see that around 28% of the young working population between 18 and 29 years old are actually 
working in this uh, agricultural sector. So in the educational system, in technical education, particularly in these fields, we have around 400,000 students up until 2022 enrolled specifically in technical education. And one of these areas of technical education is agriculture. So we have many opportunities and threats for them, such as uh, opportunities such as safe employment and agro-entrepreneurship or access to higher education or to different pathways for the job market. But uh, in terms of threats, we also have migration and aging of, in, in rural populations. Could you please go to the next slide? Our current intervention in this regard is the VAMOS program. So the VAMOS program is a multi-year program focused on building innovative and linked schools, schools that are innovative in the pedagogical practice, that foster motivation of students towards pursuing a career and finding opportunities in the agricultural sector, but also schools that are linked and have partnerships with uh, the agro-industrial sector in order to make sure that this gap between what they learn in the schools and the practical skills that they require are satisfied between uh, thanks to this alliance between schools and the productive sector. So for this, we're working with four uh, key Populations, one of them are the school leaders, the ones that are leading the schools uh, themselves. We want them to change uh, their mindsets and to develop their skills into building innovative and collaborative schools. The second group is focused on teacher leaders. Uh, these are teachers that have pedagogical leadership roles Non, not formal roles, but rather this uh, informal leadership in the schools that inspire other teachers into action. Uh, the, the third group is the entrepreneurial teachers, uh, and the fourth group are the technical teachers because they have a specific, uh, important roles into building this gap with the productive sector. So that's what I can share about our current work in BBOB, and thank you so much for in, the invitation. Thank you so much, Miguel. It's really lovely to hear the wonderful work that you are doing. Um, right next, I would love to um, introduce Sarah from the High Yellow. Over to you, Sarah. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Educate, for inviting us. And um, it's already proving to be a very interesting discussion with excellent practices um, coming from the field. At the ILA, we work more at, a, I'd say, a higher level. Uh, we're, we're trying to build the capacity within institutions so that they can better um, uh, help young people make an easier transition into the world of work. Um, for those of you who don't know well the International Labor Organization, um, we are a United Nations agency. In fact, we're the oldest ILO, uh, oldest UN agency founded in 1919 with the League of Nations. So I, we're very proud. We've just celebrated our centenary a few years ago. Um, so it's a tripartite organization, which means that we bring together governments, employers and workers organizations to set labor standards and develop policies and devise programs that promote decent work for all men and women around the globe. And um, promoting decent work, of course, takes us into a wide array of areas. Uh, we can support countries in employment promotion, which means um, it can mean working with them on pro-employment macroeconomic policy, for example, or we can go down to the, the more direct uh, area of supporting skills development, um, promoting fundamental principles and rights at work. It's, it's a very broad, but I know that the reason that uh, I've, I've been more than 20 years with the organization, and I've also been working in many areas, but I know the reason that I'm invited here today has more to do with my experience with an ILO Youth Employment Program. And specifically, we had a large um, MasterCard Foundation funded project that allowed us to run school to work transition surveys in more than 32 countries. And um, in doing that, we really had to, it, it really allowed us to broaden our knowledge base on what constitutes a, a good school to work transition survey. Uh, sorry, a good school to work transition. And it's uh, this knowledge base that I think I will be able to share with you over the course of the next hour. So thank you again for having me. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us for the conversation today. Um, I will want to move the conversation back to Justine. Justine, you're welcome. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour à tous. 
Je m'appelle Justin Koko Kassongo, je suis en République démocratique du Congo. Euh, je travaille dans les œuvres salésiennes, telles que vous pouvez voir la carte sur l'écran. Donc, nous sommes au site euh, de la République démocratique du Congo, précisément à Lubumbashi. Nous travaillons dans les œuvres salésiennes, les œuvres de Don Bosco, qui se spécialise dans l'accompagnement de jeunes dans le monde du travail. Et nous avons plusieurs centres de formation professionnelle, notamment à Goma, à Bukavu, à Kalemi, à Lubumbashi aussi. Et je suis le responsable de l'insertion professionnelle au sein de la province salésienne, dont l'objectif, c'est d'être à cheval entre les, formations, entre les centres de formation professionnelle et le, les entreprises, parce que nous travaillons pour l'insertion professionnelle des jeunes. Donc, je, je me réjouis aujourd'hui d'être aussi l'un de vous parce que je vais beaucoup apprendre et je crois avoir aussi de l'expérience par rapport à l'insertion professionnelle. Nous avons aussi un travail que nous faisons par rapport au, au travail décent. Et nous sommes un bureau d'emploi et nous avons des missions à atteindre. Je crois qu'on va passer à la, au diapo suivant. Je suis un peu en retard par rapport à la connexion, mais ça n'empêche pas. Alors, les bureaux salésiens d'emploi, c'est un bureau qui s'occupe de l'insertion professionnelle dans le monde du travail avec les six missions que vous êtes en train de voir sur l'écran. Donc, la, le premier, c'est de promouvoir la formation professionnelle et technique comme un choix de carrière pour les jeunes, parce que nous sommes dans un contrat où la formation professionnelle est à un moment donné considérée comme un choix pour ceux-là qui n'ont pas assez de moyens ou qui ne sont pas intelligents pour aller à l'école, pour poursuivre l'étude et aller à l'université. Mais nous faisons de la promotion de la, de la formation professionnelle. Nous nous occupons aussi de l'orientation professionnelle des jeunes lorsqu'ils arrivent euh, à l'école pour que nous puissions les orienter, voir euh, dans, quel, dans, dans la mesure du possible comment les, les aider à opérer les choix d'une filière. Nous faisons aussi la préparation des jeunes à affronter le monde du travail. Il y a des petites formations que nous donnons dans le développement personnel, comment faire un CV, ainsi de suite, dans l'objectif de les préparer, une fois qu'ils auront terminé, à trouver des opportunités pour s'insérer dans le monde professionnel. Donc, nous veillons aussi à l'adéquation entre la formation et les besoins sur le marché du travail. Nous nous sommes en collaboration avec les entreprises qui nous disent ce qu'ils veulent avoir comme euh, compétence dans le monde du travail et nous essayons de voir comment harmoniser cela avec les écoles pour que, euh, une fois que, la, que les jeunes ont terminé la formation, que ça soit facile pour eux de s'insérer dans le monde du travail, une fois que la formation cadre avec ce qui est euh, comme besoin dans le monde du travail. Nous travaillons aussi pour renforcer les réseautages entre nos écoles et les entreprises et aussi les secteurs publics. Donc, nous ne sommes pas euh, des centres de formation qui sont isolés dans un coin, mais nous travaillons avec les autres en réseautage. Nous essayons aussi d'assurer de, des contacts avec le monde professionnel, avec le les, les secteur public aussi, dans l'objectif de connecter nos centres de formation professionnelle dans le, avec le reste du monde. Vous pouvez voir les diapos suivants. Alors, nous travaillons aussi dans ce qui concerne le travail des sang, mais nous avons essayé de contextualiser le travail des sang chez nous parce que euh, nous avons remarqué que la définition telle qu'il est donnée par l'OIT euh, est assez euh, compliquée ou soit irréaliste dans notre contexte. Et nous avons essayé de définir qu'est-ce qu'on entend par le travail des sang chez nous, particulièrement en, en RD Congo. Et voilà, nous avons essayé de différencier les deux axes de l'insertion professionnelle, à savoir le travail salarié et l'auto-emploi. Et nous avons donné des critères pour que nous puissions considérer un travail salarié comme étant un travail décent. Et ces deux critères que nous avons donnés concernent notamment le fait que la formation doit être en, en lien avec, donc l'emploi doit être en lien avec la formation. Donc, si le jeune a suivi une telle formation, l'emploi qu'il doit avoir doit nécessairement être de cette formation-là. La deuxième chose, c'est la considération sociale. 
ce qui veut dire que euh, le travail doit être de libre consentement. Donc, le jeune doit avoir consenti de lui-même de travailler. Il ne s'agit pas d'un travail forcé. La définition au préalable des de tâches à accomplir. Donc, le travail doit être défini au préalable lorsque le contrat est signé. Il faudrait qu'il y ait le respect de l'horaire de travail parce que dans notre contrée, en tout cas, il y a des gens qui font travailler des gens plusieurs heures. Vous ne savez pas quand vous entrez et vous ne savez pas quand vous sortez. Et quand cela est comme ça, nous ne considérons pas cela comme un travail décent. Alors, il faudrait qu'il y ait aussi un minimum de dispositifs de, de sécurité physique pour que les jeunes soient protégés. Et comme autre critère, enfin, nous avons le critère en rapport avec la rémunération qui doit être en adéquation avec le salaire interprofessionnel minimum garanti, le SMIC, tel que fixé par l'État, parce qu'il y a plusieurs entreprises, parce que le, le problème, c'est que nous travaillons dans un contexte où il y a peu d'entreprises, il y a peu de donneurs d'emploi, mais il y a plusieurs demandeurs d'emploi, ce qui fait qu'il y a en quelque sorte une exploitation de la main d'œuvre, ce qui fait que des fois on paye moins que le SMIC, alors, le travail décent, nous le considérons lorsqu'il atteint au moins le salaire minimum fixé par l'État. En ce qui concerne le travail euh, auto, dans l'auto-emploi, nous considérons un travail décent lorsque les jeunes se lancent dans l'auto-emploi. C'est par rapport d'abord au chiffre d'affaires. On va voir d'abord est-ce que le, le chiffre d'affaires lui permet de se prendre en charge. Est-ce que ça lui permet de nouer les deux bouts du mois est-ce qu'il peut se constituer de l'épargne Ça lui permet de se développer. Alors, nous avons des outils d'évaluation de cela pour que nous puissions voir si vraiment l'auto-emploi va permettre aux jeunes d'avancer et peut-être être considéré comme euh, un emploi décent. La deuxième chose par rapport à l'auto-emploi, c'est la durabilité. Est-ce que c'est un travail durable Est-ce que ça va lui permettre Est-ce que c'est quelque chose qu'il fait juste pour un mois et puis ça va passer Ou c'est quelque chose où il doit se mettre et ça, ça lui rassure l'avenir de sa vie, ça lui permet d'être avec les deux pieds dans le monde professionnel. Et ce sont là les critères qui nous permettent de voir si cet emploi est décent ou il n'est pas décent lorsqu'il s'agit de l'emploi dans le cadre de l'auto-emploi. Je vais voir les, diapos, les derniers drapeaux, s'il vous plaît. sérieux problème de connexion. Voilà, alors là, je, nous avons juste mis pour vous quelques statistiques parce que nous, nous travaillons pour plusieurs écoles, mais là, nous avons juste les statistiques pour euh, une, seule, une seule école et là, c'est 2019, 2020, 2021. Vous voyez comment est-ce que nous essayons de mesurer l'emploi des sangs et nous faisons les enquêtes pour voir les jeunes quand ils terminent la formation, est-ce que Réellement, ils sont dans l'auto-emploi, ils sont dans l'emploi salarié. Cet emploi est-il décent ou il ne peut pas être considéré comme décent? Et vous allez voir en rouge qu'il y a des, 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 des statistiques qui peuvent vous permettre de voir comment est-ce qu'on mesure. Et tant bien que mal, on se rend compte qu'il y a quand même des jeunes qui trouvent du travail que nous pouvons appeler, considérer comme travail décent. Donc, je vais apprendre... Et aujourd'hui, par rapport à ce que vous faites aussi chez vous, euh, j'attends. Merci beaucoup. OK, thank you so much, Justin. We have Benoun. And last but not the least, I would love to introduce Annette. Who was that all the way from Mumbai? Annette, please introduce yourself. Uh, hi, Karima. Thank you so much. And it's honestly a pleasure to be a part of such a diverse panel with people from all over the world. And I'm looking forward to sharing uh, Pratham Education Foundation's perspective. I'm representing the Youth and Skilling Program for Pratham Education Foundation and very excited to share our experiences with School to Work Transition. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. So just to set the context for everyone, uh, if you look at India as a country, we're one of the youngest and largest workforces in the world. And we have about 12 million people entering the job market every year. And less than 5% of that workforce is formally skilled. So in India, when we talk about school to work transition, we're talking really about a transition from school to an informal workforce as opposed to a very formal workforce. And almost more than 81% of our workforce is in the informal economy as opposed to be in the formal economy. So 
when we think about school to work transition, it's really about how do we bridge those gaps between uh, people who are have ha high aspirations, who want to do big, who have big dreams, but whose economy may not be the best equipped for it. Uh, we also have a major challenge when it comes to female labor force participation. Um, it's very unfortunate that that figure has been declining over the last few years. And so a major part of our effort is towards mitigating some of these problems. We are a small drop in the ocean when it comes to the work that needs to be done in the country, but we're trying to do our bit. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, you'll see what is Pratham Skilling's approach towards solving this problem. So um, if, if I talk about our methodology, it might take a lot of time. So I'm just going to leave you with three specific points. The first one is we are very focused on getting youth entry level positions and placements in the formal workforce. So we've identified 10 industries which offer the most number of job opportunities in India. And our goal really is to see if we can get as many people as possible into those industries and the way we do this is through short-term courses uh, we offer them in residential formats in community-based training formats and our target audience really is first generation in entrance to the formal economy so we're largely talking about people who come from agrarian families who are trying to get their first job in the formal sector and when I say short-term courses, I'm referring to courses which are only about two months long in duration. So we're really talking about taking someone who's unemployed to employed in a small, small period of two months. And what the way we be, we're able to do this is by offering that training alongside industry partners and trying to really adapt the skills that we offer in a manner that meets, meets the industry need. So one thing that we're very mindful of is the fact that we are an educational organization. Our expertise lies in education. And so when it comes to skill development for industries, it's very important that we listen to the people who are going to employ the youth in the future. And I'd love to talk a little bit more about that in the upcoming rounds as to how do we collaborate with industry to make it more possible. Uh, lastly, if we can go to the last slide, uh, just a very quick a uh, few set of data points that I would like to share with everyone. We currently have about 140 training centers in India. Uh, and over the last few years, we've trained more than 200,000 people and eight, and been able to place 85% of them in uh, jobs. And the reason we've been able to do this is because we've collaborated with more than 2,500 industry partners across the country. And really that collaboration between the education sector and the industry is how we can ensure smooth school to work transition for young people in the country and uh, very excited to share the practices that we have um, been able to experiment over the last few years. Uh, I just want to leave everyone with one small quote which we have on the slide is uh, when it comes to our definition of decent work, uh, we do subscribe to the ILO definition as well as with every other definition that aligns with decent work. There's just one small bit that we hold on a little bit more closely to is this notion that when we equip youth, it shouldn't just be for a job that exists today. It should be such that they are able to stay resilient for the jobs of the future. So the goal is not just to help them enter the workforce, but to also ensure that they have the skills that are needed to sustain in the workforce in a meaningful manner. So that's it from my side. I will pause my introduction now and happy to answer more questions in the upcoming rounds. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Annette, and thank you so much to our speakers for that background, the different perspective and so much experience around the table. I'm looking forward to a lively conversation with you all, and I want us to dive right into the first question. This year's Educate.B conference invite us all to think about how and under what conditions education interventions contribute to access to decent work for youth. And that begs a reflection on what really constitutes decent work. What exactly is this decent work we are talking about? If teachers and school leaders are to take actions to smoothen the transition of young people from school or from the TVET institution into the world of work, then what is the decent work that they should be preparing young people for? Sarah, I would like to invite you first and I would also want you to enlighten us in this conversation to them about what the decent work, what does it mean from the ILO, the International Labor Organization? Over to you, um, Sarah. 
Thank you, Karimata. And um, it's really interesting to hear already some some important feedback from the other speakers on what they think these things is. I mean, we know what it is. It's 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 a very important notion that the ILO puts forth, and uh, the official definition is of decent work is that it's productive work for women and men that's attained in conditions of freedom, equity, security, and human dignity. That all sounds really beautiful, and um, we all we certainly would wish that on everybody. But we know that it's it's really a vision. It's it's a vision that we strive for. It's a sort of gold standard. Now, as I said, I'm giving you very broad strokes on this definition. If if we whittle it down, um, it requires having a fair income. And that means uh, looking at the, the wage level of each country, what is the minimum wage, and hopefully it will allow you to live above the poverty means uh, measure and guarantees a secure form of freedom, and you would have access to social protection. But as I said, back to, if, if you listen to the first seminar that this Educate series had, you'll meet my colleague, uh, Christine Hoffman, and she spent quite a lot of time on this. So if you really want the technical definition, I invite you to go backwards, but uh, let's uh, stick with the vision for the moment and recognize that the vision can be far from reality. And we still have uh, we, statistics that, that show us things like uh, one in five young persons is still neither in employment, education, or training. So in a sense, we could say that they are in danger of being left behind. And we still have two and three young persons who work in the informal economy. It's huge. I mean, this number means that who is the formal economy for? Who are these concepts for? Well, I can tell you where they originated. They originated in the, in the Western economies, uh, advanced economies, where you have strong institutions and strong uh, a very strong formal sector and labor, labor market regulations that ensure that you have a contract, that ensure that you have a decent pay, and there are repercussions to the enterprise if you don't have those standards. But in the rest of the world, which is by far the majority of the world, we know that these standards don't work. So I think Annette put it perfectly. Um, in such a situation, how do we help people that have very big dreams about the labor market that they would like to enter, then meet the reality of the labor market that's uh, ready to absorb them. And um, so let's get back to the measurement. I think Justin said it's important to be um, innovative and adaptive in our definitions. We, we build a definition that works for our own institutions. And I think his was that uh, you get a job that relates to the training that you did. That's great, Justin. When we we're doing the school to work um, surveys in this MasterCard Foundation project. We also came up with a sort of compromise definition. And we said that a completed transition is one where a young person has either a job that's stable in terms of its duration or it's satisfactory in nature. So this of course allowed us to put together the subjective and the objective element. And um, it was really interesting in, in looking at what becomes a satisfactory job for a young person. And that can, in certain contexts, be, be good enough because they know what the reality is. And uh, if their dream is not the big dream, maybe it's sufficient for them at that moment. And the institutions facilitated that. So it's really not such a bad thing. But that's does not mean that we should lose sight of the ultimate goal of decent work. It's a very long-term game that we're that we're striving for here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for um, giving us an insight into the standard of decent work according to the International Labor Organization. Um, why Justin was introducing himself, he talked about and the definition of um, decent work according to Don Bosco and what they have been doing, um, you know, when it comes to um, decent work. Thank you so much, Justin, for um, that, um, you know, definition and giving us an insight into the work that you have been doing. I'd want to pass um, this conversation to Miguel and I want to, I want you to, um, you know, let us 
slightly um you know open up the conversation on what is your perspective on this on this matter Nico sure well in the case of Ecuador um, we have this term of adequate job, which is somehow similar to what Sarah was describing as, as the as the decent work. So in Ecuador, we have different forms of, of, of job. Uh, specifically, when we talk about decent work, the expectations are normally like to have a stable contract. It means to have a contract for an, in, an indefinite period of time. Uh, salaries according to your profile and to the position to which you are um, being recruited. Uh, salaries that are according to the, to the profile and, of course, access to social benefits as well. And, of course, the additional uh, expected things such as the conditions, like, I mean, like to have a positive good environment, to have your rights being protected in your job, uh, to have access to supplies and different things. Even though this is the ideal uh, job that everybody wants to have in the past years due to several crises uh, at national level and also at global level, such as the pandemic, for example, this type of work uh, is has been reducing. I mean, the spots for this type of job has been reducing over time. So now there is actually an increase of different forms of work, such as like, for example, by contract. So you sign a contract a temporary contract for less than a year or a renewable contract in which uh, employers are not like required to actually have you as an employee for that long period of time. That's in the case of, of, of employment. Um, so in that sense, for example, something that calls my attention and it was also something mentioned by, by the previous speakers was, for example, the terms of expectation. So when a student leaves school, well, of course, we all have the expectation to have a decent work. I mean, we all expect to have a decent work. So that has also serious implication in the way in which they choose, their, for example, their careers, if they opt for a, a university studies or for higher education, that has implications because they have these um, expectations. And in that sense, for example, some studies uh, have shown like top three uh, expectations that the students have. One of them is the perception of high demand for certain careers. So for example, I choose certain type of careers because they are more likely to have this type of decent work. For example, let's compare medicine and agriculture. More people, a lot of students are trying to pursue medical careers for several reasons, but mostly one of them is because of the, the, the expectations that they are more likely to have access to decent work if they choose this career rather than agriculture. If they opt for agriculture, normally the expectations are that maybe salaries are low, maybe they are more likely to, to opt for self-employment, which sometimes people believe that self-employment has not necessarily the conditions for decent work, at least at the beginning. Uh, another uh, expectation is, for example, the average starting salary. They all expect certain level of salary that is higher than the basic salary that, that the average population has. And also the advice from the parents and family. And in that sense, for example, the Institute of Statistics and Census have shown that there is a, a, a approximately 40% of desertion in undergraduate careers. Uh, most of them, around 27% of them, mostly because they changed career. They at some point realized that these expectations are not realistic enough necessarily because of the career, but because of several factors, and they decide to switch from career. And other uh, other 13% are more, most likely most likely to decline studying and opt for joining directly the job market or doing something else like safe employment, for example. So uh, in this case, like the, the, the terms of expectations are also important because we do have this expectation of decent work, but sometimes that expectation does not match the reality that we are facing as students and teachers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miguel, for highlighting um, what young people want when it comes to decent work and our expectations. Um, I would want us to, in the next round, I want us to get into practical solutions that schools and civic institutions can use to smoothen the transition. Halis, is there any nuance or any addition um, to the conversation? Thank you very much, Karimad. Um... As the co-speakers, um, Sarah and Miguel have outlined, and also from the viewers' um, presentation so far, Justine and Annette, I think these are all relevant um, 
factors that come together to make decent work possible. Um, whether it's aspirational or whether in reality, what really decent work means. Um, for Education and Aspirations Hub, in thinking about decent work, we put the students at the center of the conversation. So in, in, in what our organization is doing to make young people valuable, achieve their valuable um, capabilities, but also do these careers make young people agents of transformation? And are young people actualizing themselves through these careers or through these forms of employment? Um, in the bigger picture, not every young people, every young person will dream big. Um, not everybody will want to be a pilot, not everybody will want to be a less. But will the available kind of job ensure that they are fulfilled enough to know that their basic needs are being reached? So their health issues, um, their pensions, the fact that they go to do to work, and it is in an environment that supports their nurturing. And so these are the kind of thinkings that we look at in ensuring that these young people going into work are being fulfilled and are flourishing. Uh, in terms of practical factors, I think one of the things that we've noticed that ensure that schools are supporting young people's smooth school to work transition is the provision of career guidance and counseling. In most instances, this conversation or this factor, factor is missing. And the idea is we all go to school and we are expected to complete school and work. But there is a disconnect in what does work look like and how do young people prepare for work. So we choose all these amazing courses, we pair them to specific works, but young people don't really know what to expect or how to prepare to transition. And so I think if there is any key um, factors that we would consider as relevant to ensure that young people are assessing available different decent work, but also are being prepared to take on these various work opportunities, including entrepreneurship, including the employees of organizations, either big, small, or medium scale level, is giving young people the information, the relevant information, the necessary resources, and um, pairing, making sure that they understand what their strengths and weaknesses are, and making them see the reality. Um, what, what kind of jobs are available in a particular context, and how can we ensure that young people know these jobs and are being prepared for? And also, how can we bring em employers into the fold of school? So I know Annette mentioned um, the informal sector. And I think when we are talking about decent work, the idea is there's this huge company out there who is going to employ over thousands of young people at a go. But that is not the reality in most low and middle income country. The reality is there are small and medium scale organizations in the informal sector, especially in STEM and TVET that may have small workshops that may employ two young people, three young people, or even give apprenticeship opportunities for young people, not helping them navigate what it looks like to have your own employment, but very informal. And these are the people that we have to begin conversations with. How do we expand the informal sector? How do we ensure that the informal, sector, informal sectors have systems that ensure that young people are experiencing decent work opportunities? So for instance, how do you, I work a lot with young girls in the TVET sector, helping them navigate what their aspirations are, how can they become entrepreneurs or how they, can they become um, employees of either small organizations or not. And one of the things that become very critical is the kind of um, a nurturing or inclusive environment as well. And in conversation with some of these young girls who had on the job training or work experiences, opportunities in the informal sector. One of the things that scared them the most was the fact that there weren't even simple structures like um, girls' lockers, um, toilet facilities for just girls alone. And so they had to share these facilities with men and they didn't feel safe. There wasn't enough security for them. And once young people have these experiences, the opportunities that we are looking for, instead of empowering them, scares them off. So I think that they are very minute little conversations that we have to bring in the fold of preparing young women for work, 
from school, but also bringing the informal sector into school and then connecting these two organizations to ensure that young people are ready for the kind of work that we would aspire them to achieve, especially for girls and vulnerable people like persons with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harleys, for highlighting and um, joining the conversation. And thank you also to everyone for clarifying the notion of this work. If you're just joining us, um, it's also my pleasure to highlight our speakers that have been in conversation with us for the past minute. Um, we have with us Sarah Helva, we have with us Alice Amiga, um, Annette Francis, Megal Herrera, and Justin Koku Kasongo. We've been having a conversation about decent work and what it is to young people and education. And some of our speakers had already entered about at what education and training can do to facilitate young people's transition from school into the world of work. And if all goes well, if all goes well, it's also into the um, decent work. I already heard about schools, what schools can or should counteract the gap that exists between young people's aspiration and the realities of the world of work. For instance, Harley's, let's say, um, with you on that point that you mentioned, you founded an organization called Education and Aspirations, which works on exactly this issue. What are some of the concrete practices that you can recommend? Hello, Alice. Yeah. So as I, I, I think some of the key practices is um, engaging with role models within um, communities, engaging with role models even outside communities. So at Education and Aspirations Hub in partnership with Education Employers Charity in the UK, um, one of the simple tools that we've used or methods that are being used out there is career talks in schools. So bringing people from the world of work to engage with students and starting very early at that um, as, as soon as possible. So there is a report that myself and Chris Percy wrote for with education employers. And what we are trying to say is when you give young people the exposure to different role models from different career sectors, what you are doing is you're challenging the social norms and stereotypes that would limit young people from aspiring or thinking about particular jobs, especially the divide, the gender divide. And also giving young people the opportunity for us at Education Aspirations Hub to go into industries or to go into schools, to go into areas where young people feel inspired to think beyond their immediate community. So these are some of the like two core things that I would mention as very relevant and in the school level, um, also possible in the community level to be done to ensure the smooth transition of young people. Mm. Thank you so much, Halis. Um, Miguel, you raised the point on young people's expectation and aspirations before in your introduction. So this must resonate with you as well as a young person. Does VVOB promote similar practices? Yeah, sorry, I struggled to find my microphone. Yeah, uh, definitely from VVOB, our expertise is mostly focused on capacity development. So we work directly with the school staff. So something that Alice mentioned before was really important, specifically regarding working with the student counselors. That's so important because they are also part of, of the school. And sometimes we think of the schools as only the teachers, but they have a, this crucial role, especially in, 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 in the school to work transition. So from BBOB in Ecuador, we can share a couple of examples of, of practice that, that we have been working on and that some of them is have scaled up to education policy level. Uh, one of them was, for example, uh, the working with, uh, specifically with uh, what we call the OVP. It means the Vocational and Professional Orientation Model. So the Ministry of Education was aiming to build this um, model in order to support schools into guiding students to find the, the correct vocation and to think of, of the strategic and in which career they want to pursue. Not only on the convenience, but also on the connection with the life plan. That's kind of the approach for this model. So we will be working on this model 
uh, before, and uh, under this model, they developed not only manuals and guides for the schools to do it, but also built some capacities, uh, capacity development workshops, for example, training workshops and peer support with the student counselors and with the teachers as well, in order to um, apply and to learn from, from practices and strategies that can support somehow the way in which they can uh, promote this um, orientation with the students, not only at individual level, but also with, for example, career talks or different strategies that can sometimes um, awaken this spark towards my, my vocation. So this is one of the practices that not right now the Ministry of Education in, in Ecuador has actually scaled up to a policy level. So now the Ministry of Education has these guides and manuals that are official and are based on the and the evidence uh, resulting from this practice. And another practice that BBOB has also developed regarding this uh, is related to employer, en employer engagement. And it's uh, still in the process, but for example, right now in our VAMOS program, we want to support this interaction, this connection between the agricultural technical schools and the uh, uh, productive sector. And we develop a, a first version of an interactive map uh, in Power BI, so we use open data from from the from different sources of, of Ecuador, especially from the uh, supervision of the banks and, and open data, and we develop this pilot of the mapping. So the idea is now with this pilot, we want to uh, strengthen capacity development of teachers and school principals into how to use this map to develop negotiation skills to talk to this association and find ways in which they can, for, for example, provide internship opportunities or other practical uh, ex experiences, such as, for example, career guidance talks uh, or visits to the agricultural say, fields nearby the schools. So different ex practical experiences can allow students to somehow build this connection between the practice the, of the real world and what they learn at school. So this is still in the pilot version. Um, but we aim this to, to understand which are the best practice, but definitely something that we believe is the development of the capacities of the teachers for negotiating and building this bridge between connecting the schools and the agro agricultural sector or the productive sector in general is very important. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Miguel. Um, internship, study and career guidance, employer engagement, these are great practices. And um, I, I must say that this must be the practices that the Don Bosco Employment Office focuses as well, and the Dep Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, Justin, can you tell us more about these practices? Ah, désolé, fallait que j'active le micro. Merci beaucoup pour la parole. En tout cas, merci beaucoup pour euh, ceux qui ont intervenu par rapport à cela. Je vais essayer de donner ce que nous faisons de manière pratique à Don Bosco, parce que la question euh, de travail décent, la question de la préparation des jeunes à affronter le monde du travail, c'est des questions très, très importantes. Mais de manière pratique, je voudrais euh, synthétiser ce que nous faisons et nous, nous les faisons en quatre étapes. Donc, c'est ce que les... les, les Les centres de formation, nous, les écoles doivent faire, nous les faisons en quatre étapes. Donc, il y a l'étape d'orientation, il y a la phase de formation, la phase de transition et la phase d'installation. Les quatre phases de la formation professionnelle et aussi de l'insertion professionnelle. Donc, lorsque les jeunes arrivent, tout commence par là. Quand ils arrivent, ils doivent être correctement orientés pour découvrir ce qu'ils sont censés faire et ils doivent découvrir ce qui les attend après la formation. De manière pratique, dans nos écoles, il y a une structure à part que nous appelons les bureaux d'emploi, qui est à cheval entre les entreprises et le, les écoles, qui travaille d'arrache-pied avec les enseignants pour orienter les jeunes. Donc, nous organisons les journées que nous appelons les journées d'orientation professionnelle. Et les jeunes sont regroupés dans une salle, c'est deux ou trois jours par exemple, où les enseignants passent pour expliquer chaque métier pour que les jeunes comprennent lorsqu'ils vont opter pour tel métier, qu'est-ce qui les attend en termes de formation. 
et les agents des bureaux d'emploi expliquent les débouchés professionnels. Donc, lorsque vous prenez ça comme format, comme option, comme filière, voilà ce qui vous attend. Voilà les chances que vous avez de trouver un emploi par rapport à notre contexte, par rapport à notre milieu. Est-ce qu'il y a des emplois par rapport à ça où vous êtes obligé d'être dans, dans, dans l'auto-emploi carrément? La deuxième phase, c'est la phase de formation. C'est-à-dire les jeunes ont déjà opté pour une formation, une filière. Ils commencent la formation, dans la, plus, dans la plupart des cas, c'est trois ans. Il y a aussi des formations de courte durée d'une année. Il y a aussi des formations de longue durée qui partent jusqu'à quatre ans. Et pendant ce temps, ce qu'il qu faut, c'est que les jeunes apprennent le métier. Apprennent le métier et ils sont aussi renforcés en compétences en ce qui concerne les compétences relationnelles, les compétences psychosociales, ainsi de suite. Et ils sont préparés donc à affronter le monde du travail. Et à ce moment-là, il faudrait que la formation soit en adéquation avec le monde du travail. Il faudrait que ce qui est demandé par les entreprises soit réellement enseigné dans les écoles. Et qu'est-ce qui se passe? Il y a cette structure-là, le bureau d'emploi, qui, qui est en contact permanent avec les entreprises, qui participe à des conférences, qui participe à des, à des journées portes ouvertes dans les entreprises, qui participe à des discussions comme celles que nous sommes en train d'avoir ici, pour comprendre quels sont les besoins actuels. Parce qu'en réalité, le monde professionnel évolue si vite en matière de technologie. Et les écoles n'auront pas assez de moyens, en tout cas même s'ils veulent avoir des moyens, ils n'en auront pas assez pour adapter la formation textuellement telle que ça s'est demandé dans les entreprises. Ce qui fait que les bureaux d'emploi qui participent à des conférences, qui visitent les entreprises, donnent de l'information à l'école pour que la formation soit d'une manière ou d'une autre adaptée euh, au monde du travail. Et en ce moment-là, pendant la formation, au moins chaque année, les jeunes sont placés, ne fût-ce que pour un seul mois, en stage dans les entreprises pour essayer de concilier ce qu'ils voient à l'école et ce qui se passe en réalité dans le monde du travail, dans les entreprises. Et après cette phase de formation, une fois que les jeunes sont certifiés, nous passons à la phase de transition. Et à ce moment-là, le jeune, il, a, il est diplômé, il attend de trouver un travail, mais qu'est-ce qu'il fait? Il n'attend pas trois croisés. Il doit, il doit euh, être orienté pour voir comment est-ce qu'il peut se connecter maintenant, à, comment avoir des relations avec le monde professionnel, et ainsi de suite. Et à ce moment-là, on peut lui trouver un, un, un stage que nous appelons les stages professionnels. Il peut le faire gratuitement dans une entreprise, dans l'objectif juste de, de se faire découvrir pour qu'on le voie, qu'il connaît quelque chose et peut-être avoir la chance de se faire embaucher. Et soit, peut-être qu'il peut... Qu être payé, peut-être pas comme les autres, mais il a au moins un transport, aller-retour, et ainsi de suite. Mais l'objectif, c'est d'apprendre davantage, de comprendre le monde professionnel, de, de s'adapter et de, de savoir comment vendre ses compétences. Et enfin, nous avons cette phase-là d'installation, ça veut dire que le jeune a déjà des connaissances, il a trouvé un emploi, il a signé un contrat de travail, et là, il est dans l'auto-emploi, il est installé, et ainsi de suite. Et il y a cette structure-là des bureaux d'emploi, dont là, la plupart des écoles, il n'y a pas, malheureusement, qui devrait être là. Et nous, dans les écoles salésiennes, on a cette structure qui s'occupe de l'accompagnement des jeunes dans le monde du travail. Cette structure-là a des bases de données des anciens élèves qui quittent l'école. Et parce qu'on est en relation avec les entreprises, les entreprises font recours à nous lorsqu'ils ont besoin de personnel. Et nous contactons les jeunes qui ont déjà terminé, qui sont dans la phase de transition pour les connecter dans le monde du travail. Donc, de manière pratique, ce sont là les quatre phases et c'est de cette façon-là que nous évoluons pour essayer euh, de, de pallier à ces, à ces grands problèmes d'insertion de, 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 professionnelle. Mais je souligne une chose, c'est que les écoles doivent travailler en collaboration avec les entreprises et avec les institutions publiques. Parce que quand il y a des contrats, quand il y a des... De, Comment je peux arriver à appeler ça? Quand il y a des partenariats, voilà. Quand il y a des partenariats avec les entreprises, vous avez des ouvertes. Les portes sont ouvertes pour vous dans les, dans les entreprises pour placer les jeunes en stage, pour euh, faire les visites guidées dans les entreprises, pour permettre aux jeunes de découvrir le matériel, les équipements de travail qu'ils apprennent en théorie lors de la formation. Mais là, ils les parlent petit doigt. Mais sans les partenariats avec les entreprises, les portes sont fermées. Et qui fait ce partenariat C'est cette structure-là, le bureau d'emploi. C'est conseiller que les écoles puissent en avoir. 
Voilà ce que je pouvais peut-être ajouter par rapport à ce que euh, Miguel et Alice ont eu à donner comme information. Merci. Thank you so much, Justine. That is a great chain of work um, from orientation to formation, transition, and also installation. Um, Annette, you used the word um, aspirational work earlier when in your introduction, and you also highlighted how little of that is actually available in the context of India. So I imagine that um, aspiration gap is something you also address. In the work that you do at Prakta, um, I would want you to, um, you know, highlight and then expatiate on that. Sure. Thank you so much for that question. And um, I want to start off by saying that it's so great to hear the problems that other countries are facing is the same as the ones we are facing. And there are solutions which are also very similar to the ones we are implementing. Um, and I, I, and I think I want to build on this very specific point that uh, many years ago, we might have been told that if you go to school and you study well, or then you maybe go to college and you study well, then you will get a good job. And that's it, right? And then it's a good job forever. But the world we live in today is that that's not the reality for the vast majority. This is probably a dream for a very small percentage of young people. So the idea is that the transition from school to work is not linear anymore, right? There are different ways which you have to follow in order to be able to get to your aspirations. And I think the toughest part for young people is to give them that hope that um, you might not fulfill your aspirations at the first step, maybe not at the second step, but you might get it at the third step, right? Uh, I want to give one story and maybe that kind of explains the point that I'm trying to get to is uh, we have this training center where we offer a very entry level course into the healthcare sector. Healthcare, just like everywhere else in the world, is a very aspirational sector in India. If you talk to a lot of young children, they'll tell you they want to become a doctor when they grow up. But it's a very competitive field. To become a doctor means you have to be at the top of the school. Uh, you have to have the best grades and you have to clear one of the most difficult entrance examinations. So most likely, a lot of young people are not able to become uh, like doctors. They can't get admission into a medical college. So we have a very entry level course, which gets you into a role called general duty assistant. So it's a very entry level position in a hospital. And recently, I had a chance to talk to some students who completed this course. So what they did is they did this course, they got jobs in a hospital at a very entry level, and they started saving money, which they then used to pay for the school college fees in a nursing college. And what had happened is even though after school, they did not have the marks necessary to get them into the nursing college. Now, because they had worked for a few years and they had built up some skills, they were better equipped to go back to nursing college. And so now what they're doing is they're studying for nursing college while also working part time. And their hope is that they will save more money to be able to pursue more advanced degrees in the future. So, And I think this to me is probably the way future of work is going to change for a lot of young people where you can't just give up after your first degree or your first uh, failure. You have to try different, different pathways. So whether it's apprenticeship or trying out different short term courses or online courses or even working for free for a few months so that you can later get a job which pays you better. I think these are different pathways that people follow so that the end goal, like Sarah said, like the end goal should be that decent work, that that real definition of decent work. But maybe it's not something you might get right after you leave school. And I hope as an ecosystem, we're able to yeah, like, you know, sort of na navigate people towards that pathway. I also want to build on the point that Alice mentioned about the fact that the definition of an employer is not necessarily just someone who recruits thousands of people. Yeah. Employers today could be someone who's recruiting five people, 10 people, two people. And it's very important that they are also recognized as role models by young people. I think the challenge we see in India is that, um, and maybe this is true in different parts of the world where uh, people only look at the top people of the industry as role models. But the reality is that if there is an electrician in your village who is able to employ five people and is able to make enough living that they are able to send their kids to school and those five people are getting decent salaries through them, then that is an aspirational employer. That's an employer who's offering decent work. And I think employers like those also need to become role models for young people. This is something that we try to do in Pratham, where in all our training centers, we try to make role models out of the people who are trying these different 
traditional and conventional pathways, people who are smaller employers, people who might try slightly different routes. So that way, we're not demotivated at any point of time because at the rate at which technology is changing, the rate at which work is changing, young people need to be resilient. They need to have hope. Uh, they need to have aspirations for the future and they cannot give up just at that immediate transition from school. So that school to work transition might be a lifelong transition where you have to do different things and upgrade yourself and upskill yourself in the coming years. And uh, I think those are some of the small things that we try to do. And I think the main message is... Um, we can't just go by the old ways. We have to come up with new strategies. We have to come up with new methods. And sometimes that means going more grassroots than going more bird's eye. And you know, trying to figure out how that works is, is really the challenge. And making sure that it's a contextualized solution that works for each country, each locality, so that if you're not just doing a plug and play solution. And I think those are some of the small things that we can try to do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hanet. Young people should not give up and these are great examples that you have highlighted and sarah we've heard about quite a pro a few promises uh you know practices such as study and career guidance employer engagement party card training at school or in the workplace you know we talked about project-based learning to also develop young people's entrepreneurial skills what would you like to respond to or had well let me just say I'm so inspired by the speakers that we've had here. I mean, we at the ILO put a, a list of to-dos in a book. Um, you should do career guidance. You should do uh, uh, mentoring. You should have career days. You should engage with employers. You should embed realistic expectations. You all are doing it. I mean, you are doing it. And uh, I think it's extremely motivating for us to see how this can be done. So bravo to you. And I love what Annette said about uh, the end game is not the school to work transition. I mean, the school to work transition is just one step. Yeah. If, you, if we think that we as institutions are finished at the moment that a young person receives their first job, then, then shame on us because that job is simply one of the pathway that will continue through the lifetime. So we need to be ready to support them through um, making the many transitions that they will make through adulthood and, uh, and then beyond. So thank you for, for raising all of these very important issues and for sharing with us your experience and on all of the good practices. Now, well, I think one, one thing that hits home to me is that uh, a lot of the work that you're doing in, in these countries, um, it's important, it's so important, but it will need to be scaled up, right? And the big question is how do we do that? Knowing that um, to get it right, it requires money, it requires time, it requires uh, political will. Oftentimes we have um, great donors, like even education, educate, aid, educate, who's willing to come in and help build the capacity at the local level. The ILO is there. But um, how do you make that sustainable? And um, I, I like Miguel. I think, Miguel, it sounds to me like Ecuador uh, within, within the government is really trying to, to scale up and to, to make some of these practices more sustainable and building the capacity within the schools, within the teachers. And I think that's, that's really great. So uh, there's a lot that we can learn from each other. Um, but I don't have the answers of how to make it bigger and better, but I do know that there's a lot of um, big level initiatives that are trying. Um, one, one that I'm aware of is the ILO African Union Youth Employment Strategy that was just launched this year. Uh, or they have, maybe haven't even signed it, but of course they, they really know that uh, doing more for young people in Africa I mean, it's it's not even a question. We we have to do it. One in five, one in three persons on the globe by 2015 will be African. So if we want to avoid a negative youth quake from Africa, we need to make sure that Africans are are capacity are um, given the capacity to to flourish. And um, so the the governments and African Union know that they need to take this very seriously and they will try to do that. Another um, announcement that I recently came across in Sub-Saharan Africa, that um, 24 Sub-Saharan African countries are coming together. They're building a TVET network. Again, 
that's very important so they can learn from each other and uh, strengthen their, their own institutional capacity. So thanks. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you so much to our speakers for sharing these great examples of the work that they do and for the world of practices that schools and TVET institutions can implement, um, you know, to smoothen young people's transition from school to work. But of course, um, schools and TVET institutions cannot easily achieve this on their own. And then we need enabling environment and we need government, we need employers, we need financial and technical partners that would create this condition um, to make it easier for schools to implement all practices that we have mentioned. Um, Sarah mentioned it in our conversation. And very quickly, in about 30 seconds each, I want all our speakers um, to talk about what do they want from the government, employers, and all these financial technical partners um, that they can do to create them. Very short, I mean, 30 seconds, let's go. Um, I would want to start with Justin, please. Over to you, Justin. Got any more? Sorry, we lost Justin for a moment. So please go. Oh, oh yeah. With some of the other. Okay, speakers. great. Yeah, um, I, I will just um pass the okay. conversation to Hallis. Over to yeah. you, Hallis. Thirty seconds. Yeah, I think in context where there are a lot of challenges, like we see in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in India as well. Um, while policymakers try to find their ways to to sponsor or to expand or to scale up some of these initiatives. For us, education aspirations are one of the main things that um, coming from a research background, but also implementing these ideas is to provide the evidence for government to see what could work in what context and how. I think this is very relevant in sort of scaling up some of these ideas, but most importantly, being allies for this change partnering with community leaders, partnering with teachers, partnering with schools, partnering with parents and young people themselves. And that builds the momentum for scaling up as well. So I think it's um, it, what is important is that we are building the evidence, but also creating room for necessary partnership for scale up. Thank you so much, Hallies, for that. Uh, we need to be Hallies when it comes to this and moving this train forward. Um, Hanet, over to you. What would be your addition to this conversation very quickly? Yes, I think um, getting them to be our partners because one thing that we have to be very mindful about is that the industry, the skills that the industry needs is changing at the speed of light. So unless the industry collaborates with us, we won't be able to upskill the young people with the skills that they need. So that intense collaboration between the education sector and the employer is something that is very important. And I'm hoping that employers in the future will open their doors more warmly to us so that we can co-create these solutions together. Yeah. Thank you so much, Annette. Uh, Miguel, I want your contribution on this also very quickly. So quickly, I think the responsibility of building the school to work pipeline is both like the responsibility of the student, but also it implies a lot of, of support from different actors, not only the school, but at the government level and also at NGO level. So I think that multidimensional approaches are very important. In, educational interventions are important and have important effects on it, but they also need to be complemented by other complementary uh, interventions, like such as in security, in economic, mix in the improvement of employment conditions. And also I wanted to strengthen the, that the investment in professional capacity development of school leaders and teachers is important, as well as investment in information systems to trace student pathways and to trace um, the progress of these students and you know the, the, their progress after schools. Thank you so much, Miguel. And to um, round off this conversation about the wants that we want government, financial institutions and technical partners to do, I would want Sarah to please um, very quickly um, tell us about, with your world of experience, what do you think that they can contribute when it comes to um, you know, this conversation? 
Well, I think it's we can back each other up. That's one thing. I mean, we're all working at various levels, um, the grassroots level, uh, meta level and government level. At the government level, we 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 recommend or we always promote this idea of having the comprehensive uh, and cohesive policy approach, which means, I mean, we can't be working at the skills development level alone. I mean, we also need to make sure that governments are investing enough in their employment services that um, they know how to deal with sub subsidized employment and they know how to do entrepreneurship promotion. Each of these areas is, is so important for opening up the door for young people. In fact, there's been studies about which of the areas more effective than others. And that's important information for donors. And uh, just so that you know and feel good about your, your work area, you get a slight edge if you, if you work in um, skills development and entrepreneurship promotion compared to um, an intervention that might be related to wage subsidy. And um, um, so you are all working in the right direction and we need to make sure that governments can put all pieces together and doing so within social dialogue with workers and employers. And that's a, a very um, idealistic ending, but we, we will get there, I, I'm sure of it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you so much to all of our speakers for their reflections. And I heard that some recommendations um, for government, for employers, and their financial, their technical partners as well. And I'm also sure that our audience here, they are very keen to share their thoughts and questions as well. So I'm going to open the floor for um, one or two um, questions, and we will start with some questions and comments that we entered in the chat box. Um, yeah, so we will just take about um, one or two um, questions. Yeah, so um, one of our, um, our audience today asked a question. He said that in Ecuador, as well as in other Latin American countries, the illicit economies have supported the reality, including as a real option to unemployment and education. What are your policy and program recommendation for this contest? Uh, over to you, um, Justin. No, I, I, I think maybe it's for me, the, the question. Um, well, sure. Uh, thank you so much, Anna, for your questions. I will try to answer uh, bo both of them here so that you can uh, have more clarity. And if not, we can also continue the conversation after the panel. So feel free to, to let me, so to contact me. Uh, so regarding the first question about uh, good evidence-based examples, well, um, I think that the strongest one, one of the strongest ones is the OVP model, uh, which is um, um, in Ecuador is the professional um, and vocational orientation. I think it's uh, right now uh, the ministry uses this model a lot in the schools, specifically for for motivating, uh, for uh, giving the, the teachers and the school principals and the student counselors uh, the materials and the methodologies in order to uh, foster this orientation and training. So I think that's kind of the strongest one, especially because it has been scaled up to a policy level. So we have definitely the, the, guide, the guides available on our website in uh, BBOB in Ecuador. I think it's ecuador.bbob.org. Um, so uh, you can find there the guides and also some reports about its implementation. And I'm, I think that also um, there are some data upon uh, available upon request, especially from the Ministry of Education, because they have this internally um, managed. Uh, so that's kind of like regarding the first one, I would say that the, the strongest points uh, for these interventions are like the closeness and the strong relationship with the ministries of education and also to keep it informed, locally informed through fieldwork because we conducted a lot of fieldwork and interviews with the teachers, with the students. So that's that also makes that the intervention is actually informed on the need, the actual needs of, of the people in, in the territory, in the fields. And in the second aspect regarding the policy recommendations, uh, considering the illicit economies, I would say that definitely multidimensional approach in interventions is very important. So definitely you can do a, an intervention in, 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 in education, but uh, it's, uh, sometimes something that limits us is the fact that we are not expert in something, but we can 
find the right partner for that. So, so in terms of that, for example, regarding the crisis of security in Ecuador, something that is important is to make sure that we, we can work with organizations that have experience on that, dialogues with the Ministry of Interior, uh, things like that. But multidimensional aspects are important and also suggestions regarding um, like um, uh, interventions in other aspects. So for example, tackling the need. If there is actually a need on, at the economic level in these communities, economic innovation should go with still in, uh, should be still conducted in these schools, but suggestions not only to the Ministry of Education, but to other ministries can be. So for example, in our case for the VAMOS program, we also work uh, in dialogues with the Ministry of Agriculture, because it's also important to get to know like the view, not only from the educational side, but also from the technical part. So this type of dialogues at multi-sectoral level is also very important. Those are like the recommendations that I can give you based on our experience. Thank you so much, Miguel, for that answer, to the saucy answer to our questions. And then we have come to the end of our question of and answer. But to close this um, session, I would want to give each of our speaker the opportunity to share a very brief closing message. So over to our speakers, if there is one point you want the audience to take away, what will it be? And we are going to go in this order. Annette first, then we go to Hallie's. Then we go to Justin, Miguel, and Sarah. Over to you, Halis. One sentence. Thank you very much, um, Karima. It has been an, um, an interesting and very insightful session. I think one of the key takeaways is the fact that whilst decent work is aspirational, there is the opportunities or there are factors that we can put in place to ensure that young people achieve these um, aspirations as well of and transition smoothly into decent ways. I think what I would put as takeaway is the fact that there is a gap between education and work and the world of work and the world of work will continue to change and that there should be that bridge or that intersect to ensure that young people have the adequate information adequate resources to ensure that they are able to travel through this gap and through on this bridge to ensure that they are they are fulfilling the aspirations but also transitioning smoothly to become um the labor force that we all um a dream for them to become thank you thank you over to you hanet Thank you. I think uh, the only the final thoughts that I would want to leave us with is if we want to help young people achieve their aspirations, then we need to work on their awareness, on their abilities, and we need to come up with creative activities through which they can engage with the employment uh, sector even better. And um, I think there's a lot of work to be done. Like Sarah said, this, this is a problem that has to be solved at scale. So how do we solve it at the scale that it needs to be addressed is a real question for all of us. And how do we pull in the resources for all of it? together is not something we can do alone, but something that we have to do in the collaborative manner and in the unity. So looking forward to seeing how we tackle this in the future. Thank you very much, Hanet. Over to you, Justin. Okay, je suis reconnaissant à tout ce que nous avons eu comme information. C'est vraiment très important pour moi d'avoir participé à cette conférence. Est-ce que je pouvais dire En dernière analyse, c'est que euh, pour que la formation professionnelle soit de qualité et espérer que les jeunes trouvent un travail décent après la formation, il est très important que les trois parties prenantes essentielles de la formation professionnelle puissent travailler en synergie. Et ces trois parties, il s'agit des écoles, les entreprises et l'État, les institutions publiques. Lorsque les trois parties prenantes, chacun joue son rôle comme il faut, alors on peut espérer que le jeune puisse trouver un travail décent. Je remercie tout le monde. Euh, Peut-être la prochaine fois, on aura l'occasion de partager davantage. Merci. Thank you, Justin. Um, I want to pass it on to Miguel, then Sarah. Sure. Well, as a conclusion, I think that there is it, it is important to make 
build uh, to build the um, bridges and articulate the work not only at the school level but also between the school and the world of work i think that that building that bridge is very important and, I, and that means to create the dialogues and to think strategically on how to create relationships between the schools and the potential employers and the current employers and also the ones who regulate this employment because it's type of dialogues can be very productive. And also uh, to allow the teachers and the schools to think of themselves of the best strategies to approach to them because what works in one school might not work on the other one. So to build this capacity is a better approach rather than to tell them how to do the things. So I think that's why building these bridges is very important so that we can still rely on this local leadership of these schools. Thank you so much. Well, um, let me just finish with the, I mean, we rely on the leadership of those in this room, in this virtual room, and we will keep up the good work and keep this communication going. I think these dialogues are so important for all of us to learn about what's happening at uh, within each country. If there was something that whetted your appetite, you can maybe adopt that in your own context. We at the ILO are very good at gathering good practices and spreading the word. And um, so thank you so much for bringing us into this dialogue. And just uh, we will continue to tackle this issue from, from all levels. And thank you for your enthusiasm and your positive energy. And thank you for the organization. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for our lovely speakers on their excellent points. Thank you so much, Alice Amiga, the founder, Education and Aspirations Ghana, an educational consultant at the World Bank. Also, Sarah Helder, the Head Employment Analysis and Economic Policy Unit of the International Labour Organization. Hi, hello. Annette Francis, the Director of Skilling, Entrepreneurship and, and Livelihoods from Pratam in India. Miguel Arrera, the Education Manager, Vivi Hobi in Ecuador. And also, lastly but not the least, Justin Koku Kasongo, the Coordinator, Job Placement Office, VIA Don Bosco of the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And also to our wonderful audience for your presence and your active participation. We have come to the end of this lovely conversation on decent work. We hope to also see you next week for the fourth and the last practical session of the 2023 Educate.B International Conference on Education and Decent Work. That session, we dive into the work-based learning as a lever for decent work, and it is still possible for you to register through the link in the chat. Until then, and wishing you a great rest of the day and week. Thank you so much for joining the conversation today. <music>